you know what? I'm going to start recording on the computer. Johanna, uh, we, I think we have a guest. Yeah. Um, did you, oh, so, Sergeant Arms, you have already started the meeting. Okay. Yes, I didn't yes. hear. I didn't hear anything until like right now. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Thanks for filling me in. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and most Toastmasters and most welcome guests. Uh, Deepak, did you want to unmute yourself and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. This is Deepak, and um, this is the first time I, I've been planning to join this meeting like two, three weeks ago, but then I couldn't make it. So this is first time. Thanks a lot. <laughs> this platform really awesome. Um, I'm 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 basically from India, Pune, right now. I'm in Gulf region. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm contributing to the success of Juniper Network here, and we are working for a local company. So I'm not really sure if I can join this group or I cannot. And this is one question I would I, I would love to um, you know, discuss, uh, ask you. And if no, then what what are the other ways um, or where I can uh, join? So. So suddenly, uh, the aim to join this is you can clearly see that I, I need to improve my public speaking and things like that. So, so that's the only aim. Uh, yeah. You're welcome. Um, I, I I'm sorry I didn't catch what part of India you're you're in right now or what part you're. I, I am from Pune. Uh, working out of. Working out of. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we've had Toastmasters internationally, um, even within our meeting, we've had people join from Russia, Japan, different countries um, as well, India as well included. So we have um, had even members, I think, that were uh, based out of there as well. So uh, definitely welcome, Deepak. And I think you did great this morning. So uh, you're definitely thank on you your on your pathways to improvement. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Most welcome. All right. And then before we... Uh, Jump into the meeting here. We're going to introduce the Toastmaster of today, who is Gaudav. Um, so Gaudav will either choose somebody to do an invocation or do an invocation for the meeting theme um, of today. And so please welcome one of our newest members, but also somebody uh, that we've seen that really just flourish and blossom in this club. Um, Gaudav, welcome this morning. Hey, good morning, fellow Toastmasters. Um, thank you, Hannah. All right. Uh, the today's theme is equilibrium. Equilibrium. We can apply that in different areas. It's a vast theme. If we narrow down to any of our life, or like theme, our work, our personal relations, we have to maintain an equilibrium state of mind between emotions and the speech. Equilibrium between good and bad. Equilibrium between the relations. If you observe a very good speaker and an influencer, they will maintain a very good equilibrium state of the word that they deliver and the emotion they express. To a good leader and an influencer, the followers will follow their footpaths. If you want to be a leader, the purpose of being an equilibrium is to lead to improve ourselves to the next step and keep forwarding us. Thank you. So we have to fill few roles. Uh, we don't have, a, we have only one speaker today and we don't have an evaluator for speaker two one. Speakers. We have two speakers. Okay. We have Georgie as a backup speaker. Um, would anyone like to evaluate speaker one, which is rhyming? And speaker two is Georgie. I can evaluate either one, Gautam. Yeah. Or okay. oh, go ahead, Tao. Yeah. Okay, I'll fill uh, Tao uh, to evaluate Vaimi and okay. Hannah to evaluate Georgie. Tao and Hannah. All right. Uh, we need an accounter. Who's Haru? GE? Oh, I, I'm GE. Okay, cool. Just I'm GE. Yep. General evaluator is. I can be Haru. odd counter. I can yeah. be odd counter. We have a ballot counter, I assume it's Hannah. 
So Haroon, can you explain the role of ballot, ballot counter? I'm oh, sorry, oh. of a counter? Oh, sure. I, I thought we were going to go through the roles. And I don't know. Anyway, good morning, fellow Toastmasters, and good evening to, uh, to all of our uh, Toastmasters who are joining guests, who are joining us from the U.S. and uh, uh, from internationally. My job as role as, uh, as a counter is to be, is to count all the ahs and ums and all the filler words that you would normally use in a conversation. As you can see, I've already done my share of them and I've lost count of the ones that I've done. But the point of, the point of this role is to help you evaluate where you use your filler words and help you avoid them later on. Thank you very much. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Arun. We have a ballot counter. Uh, I guess it's Hannah. Good morning, once again, Toastmasters and most welcome guests. I will be counting ballots at the end, towards the end of the meeting. Um, we will be sending a Google Drive link where you can vote for your best speaker, best evaluator, and best table topics master for this morning. Uh, we'll count up the votes towards the end and announce the winners for the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Mm -hmm. We need a word, master and grammar here. Yeah. I can be grammarian. Okay. okay. I'll take a word master. Okay. Uh, we need a joke master. Why me? Would like to be a joke master. I will attempt to come up with a joke at the end, but right now I'm I'm gonna uh, yeah I I'm also the timer. Yes. Yeah, so I'll put you tentatively you as a joke master. Okay. All right, uh, we have the role is filled. Harun, would you like to explain the role of grammarian? Certainly, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you. As grammarian, my job is to help you identify and keep track of interesting usage of the English grammar. So any interesting phrases or creative use of words or, uh, or words that actually have an impact, I'll keep track of them. And my job is also to keep track of any misuse of the grammar. So if you miss a proposition or you're using the wrong tense, I'll let you know at the end of the meeting. Thank you very much. And then Mr. Tesmaster. Thank you, Harun. So I'm the word master of, for today. So the role of the word master, master is uh, in make sure that everyone use the word of the day today. Word of the day today is opine, which means hold and state as one's opinion. For example, a man is a genius, he opined. I'll be posting this word in the chat and Please use it during the meeting. All right. Vaiming, would you like to explain the role of the timer? Uh, yes, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmaster, and most welcome guests. My function of timer is to run this clock in, in one of the cells in the grid for the speeches. Uh, five to seven minutes, at least mine says five to seven minutes. I assume Georgie's is also five to seven minutes. When she comes back, she can tell me otherwise. At five minutes, the green light will come on. At six minutes, the yellow. And then at seven minutes, the red light will come on. And the speaker has 30 seconds to finish. For the evaluation, is two to three minutes. And then for the, for the table topic, it's one to two minutes. I do not have to opine on this because I can just report this at the end of the meeting. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much. To be missing your role, table topics. The today table topics master is Chargy. Okay, uh, I'll fill in for Georgie. 
so table topic masters come up with impromptu topic and that will give an opportunity for everyone to talk for two minutes the talk time is two minutes for each table topic questions I think we filled and we have explained about all the roles let's give our hand rise to our host speaker why me why me has been one of our long members in our group and he has been giving a very good insightful thoughtful speech and i'm sure you will love your speech so why me had very good state of mind he open any topic that he takes and we love it over to why me thank you very much so in 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 last in this last speech i gave i talk about how how one would learn from another person in terms of different types of relationships today i'm going to talk specifically about how leadership is learned in a particular situation in in the in the family business situation so i'm going to be in fact i would define leadership to be a very narrow definition it is delivering results by commanding resources and people over a long period of time like 5 plus years so that's what i mean by leadership here and there are essentially three elements at least in my opinion one of them is vision and direction you know have to know where to go the other one is only the command of the resources and the people to execute on that vision and then the third thing most importantly is the drive and execution to actually deliver the result in success so those are the three elements of leadership so how how do you actually uh, and 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 one of the things that that uh, this professor in stanford a fairly famous professor jeffrey pfeiffer jeffrey pfeiffer he wrote a number of books he said leadership is a skill it is a skill and can be mastered with practice and coaching the tricky thing is how do you practice and how do you get coaching on it because one of the key thing with leadership that i define is this idea of command of resources and people and resources is money people is power money and power are really precious and most people have a hard time getting it and so how do you actually be able to use that to then exercise your leadership so there are a number of situation that would enable you to do that in silicon valley people do that by just starting themselves they start a company and then so examples are like steve jobs and elon musk and larry ellison you can go down the long list of people who have started companies who become very powerful and great leaders in this world there as another way you can climb up the corporate ladder ladder or the political ladder or organizational ladder or military ladder so you just start from the beginning and just go through the years and just become increasingly more of a leadership position get into a leader's role so so that's only another way to get there a third way is you a you are a prince you are a princess and and you are part of that kingdom or empire and then you just somehow get trained by the king to become the next leader now one of the most interesting thing similar to this kingdom idea is family businesses family businesses is where a lot of leaders get trained and and so i'm going to talk about that when you look at the world over 70% of the world gdp is actually owned by family businesses In fact, in the U.S., that's 57 percent, and 63 percent of the workforce is actually uh, run by family businesses. Now, there are lots of family businesses. You can go down the list: Walmart, Roche, Novartis. Those are all family businesses. Whether they're public or not, they're still family businesses. But most of them are not run by members of the family. So ownership is not the same as leadership. At the same time, there are certain companies. There are rare of them. rare a rare of them but but some of them uh, are run by family members one of them is comcast comcast is an enormous company 
It started in 1963. So I'm going to tell the story of Comcast and the Roberts family and how leadership was inherited, at least from the outside. So Ralph Robert started Comcast by buying some small company in Mississippi to provide cable television. In the 1960s, people get TV over the air. They just go put an antenna on, you get TV. However, to get cable is, 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 is a rare thing, but, but there, there was a sort of small businesses that people have in rural areas, especially because you don't have wife, you know, enough for, of a radio to, to actually catch TV. So he started a business there. He came from a rich family, but he, his parents, his father died and then they, the family lost all the money. So he wanted to be an entrepreneur, so he started this business. It was a small business, but when he had his son, Brian, he, he took him everywhere. Every time he gets a loan, he takes, takes Brian to the bank. And, and when Brian was old enough in high school, he taught him how to trade stock. So when Brian had time outside of school, he would look at the Wall Street Journal, figure out what stock to buy and, and what, what his investment is. So he became very competitive in, that, in terms of being able to try to win. So over time, Brian, uh, got a degree from University of Pennsylvania in finance. And then he started working for his father, Comcast. The first job he had was to sell the cable TV service by knocking on people's doors. And over time, he moved on to installing cable by climb, uh, climbing up the poles and then running the cables. And then over time, he got to get on higher level into finance and everything, and then represented the company in, in, in situations dealing with uh, like the, the Turner situation, Turner Broadcasting and, and other, and he learned how that he grow by growing the company, and that's how he developed his vision, by acquiring bigger and bigger company. And Comcast over time has acquired, since he became president at, at 31 years old of the company, has acquired companies like QVSC and, 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 uh, and AT&T Broadband, as well as NBC. So Comcast has gotten to be, when he first became president, uh, after years of training by his father, uh, it was around $657 million in revenue. By the time he finished, 30 years later, it's over $109 billion, 160 times bigger in terms of revenue compared to when it started. And he got all that training on the vision on how to actually drive the company as well as uh, delivering results and also command of the people. He understand the organization, where the resources are, how to use them by training by his father. So the point is family businesses is a fertile ground to train to get leadership training. Now, I didn't come from a rich family, so I don't get that. And I, I, I don't know whether you do. Uh, and, and frankly, we're too old. Yeah. So now you have to look at next generation. Your next, if you ever have your child, you have to look at it. How do you train that person to be the next leader? And if you're not ready for that, you can train yourself to be the leader and then you can train that person. So the point is family matters. Mr. Toastmasters. Thank you, Verming. Um, that was the most inspiring story, and it's a very good one for uh, to kickstart our Wednesday. Uh, please feel free to give your feedback to Yami in the chat. Please use the private option to send your feedback to the Yami. Let's take a minute for the feedback. All right, let's move on to uh, Georgie. 
our next next speaker is Georgi. And the topic is okay. Maybe I'll let Georgi to give the title of the topic. Okay, yeah. So your financial life. Georgi has been one of our longest member of the club, and she has been giving this topics, speech topics related to the financial stuff, and it's been very useful for everyone. And we are learning new stuff on new, every speech that we get from Georgie. Georgie, please take it over. Georgie, you are on mute. I think you are still in mute. Sorry, for some reason there, I lost the gallery all of a sudden. No, all right. Can, we can hear you. Great. Okay. So let me, let me stop. Is that? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Today we are going to continue talking about finances that affect our lives and this time we're going to talk about something a little out of the current use for a lot of people and that's charitable foundations or at least you might think they're out of your current current worldview. So let's start talking first about how charity is run in the United States. When people think of charity they tend to think of the big mega donors. And one of the earliest mega donors that most people think about is Andrew Carnegie. He founded U.S. Steel and his big contribution to society was he built over 3,000 public libraries starting in 1883. He was so magnanimous in his charity that even though he was one of the wealthiest people on the planet, by the time of his death in 1919, he had given away almost 90% of his vast fortune. So that's kind of the way things work in the United States. There's a lot of give and take between the US government and charity. The concept you can imagine is that the United States sort of began out of a raw wilderness. So everyone had to volunteer and work together if they wanted to build a town there. As a result, everything in the United States, whether it was schools, prisons, even charity balls, everything, all of life kind of came from the volunteers and the energy that people had in order to form all of these clubs and organizations to improve their services to their community. The U.S. government has been part of that and they've been very interested in encouraging that sort of behavior from the citizens. And it's, you can see it even from the earliest tax bills that's been passed, the Tariff Act of 1894 included tax exemption for certain charitable organizations. So like I said, we've been looking into this sort of thing for the United States for a while. So unfortunately, a lot of rich people who were supposedly giving back to charity in the olden days weren't quite as magnanimous as as Mr. Carnegie, and as a result, the federal government had to pass some additional tax reform legislation, some of the biggest coming in 1969. So if you want to have a tax-exempt organization, a charitable foundation, they've got to follow certain rules. One of the biggest ones is that you need to have a 5% minimum uh, distribution of the money that is held by the charity. The reason was that a lot of rich people before this formed charities, but they held on to all of the money. This, these charities were actually a way for them to keep their money and keep it in such a way that they got to pay almost no taxes on it. Hence the idea of the 5% minimum distribution. There's also now legislation against self-dealing. I can't have a charity that somehow grants money 
tax-free to my business, for example. That's considered a no-no. That's considered self-dealing. Also, I can't have a charity in which I get paid $10 million and I give away $5,000 in charity. It's just, it's, once again, it's, it's not the right way to do charity. Now, the other thing that they do is the reason that people do like to have charity is that while they might give away 5% of the money, they still have 95% of the money sitting there. So what do you do with it? You invest it. You put it in the stock market, you put it into companies, whatever you do with it. In the, back in 69, they had a 4% tax on any sort of income that came in from this money. They reduced that to 2% in 1978. Likewise, if you were to, with your charitable foundation, use 97% of that money in some sort of unrelated business income, like for example, maybe you got an IPO in Twitter, for example, or, or Uber, that, that's not part of your core charity, that's considered unrelated business incomes and you have to pay money on that. Likewise, you can't hold more than 20% of a business. You also are not allowed to influence legislation or elections. Also, the IRS insists that you tell them where the money is going, when, the mo when money is granted as part of your charity. So that way they can keep track of kind of what's going on with all this. So when the legislation was first passed, people opined that that might drive charitable giving down. In actuality, charitable contributions and giving has increased quite a bit from, from people from wide ranges from uh, people on the left, people on the right, religious organizations, secular, everything. And there are charities all over the place. The chart that you see on the screen is actually from the IRS itself. The black bar indicates the number of charitable organizations that are required to file paperwork with the IRS. The gray bar below it are the charities that are not required. These sort of charities would be things in the US like religious organizations, churches, mosques, synagogues, things like that. So they don't actually have to send anything to the IRS. Some of them do just because they want to. We have seen as a result, the charitable expenditures, both uh, the money given away by the charities and the money spent by the charity itself to maintain the charity has increased much more than the GDP of the United States. We also see that some of the biggest public charities are actually going to some of the wealthiest organizations, as you can see from the other chart. You see that Harvard, Stanford, Yale, those assets they have in their charities, that's billions of dollars, and that was 2004. So these organizations are doing quite well. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Gates Foundation today, and I will talk a little bit more about the Gates Foundation in my future speech. The reason why, it is the largest private foundation in the world. Currently, it's running about $50 billion in assets. The other reason is it, one of the few that actually publicly publishes their tax returns, donor lists, grant recipients, fund investments online so that everybody can see what's going on. Now, once again, you may ask, why exactly are we talking about foundations? I don't have $50 billion sitting around. I don't know about you. The reason we're doing that is, as I said, they may give money away, but they also invest most of that money. And as you can see from the chart, this is a list of the stocks that this particular foundation has invested in. So you get Berkshire Hathaway, which isn't unusual since one of the, one of the organizers for the foundation is uh, Warren Buffett. We well, also see things like Caterpillar, uh, Crown Castle. Like I said, these organizations do move the market and they do affect your life. So as I said, private foundations move markets and they also can change the world. Going back to what's something that Alexander Tocqueville said when he visited the United States in 1831, Americans all can come together and they often do with lots of energy to pursue their aims as a group. So how will you give back even though you don't have $50 billion? Thank you. Thank you, Georgie. Let's give a feedback uh, in the private chat to Georgie.
all right uh, today's general evaluator is harun harun please the floor is on yours harun you are on mute thank you mr toastmaster fellow guests i appreciate uh, appreciate this thank you garden and wei ming evaluations are one of the most important part of uh, our typical toastmaster meeting it helps gives feedback to the speakers about the topics about their style and really builds this feedback loop where a speaker will tell you or speak to the audience and the audience will give them feedback it actually provides an avenue for improvement and pointers and weaknesses where the speaker can improve their uh, their speaking skills so for our first evaluator is going to be Tao, who will be evaluating Wai Ming. Tao is uh, is a longtime member of our club. He is a uh, prolific reader and uh, and speaker, and has speak, spoken about a number of topics. And it's always good to listen to his insights. Tao. Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator. So today I'll be evaluating Wai Ming's speech. As, as introduction alluded to, Wai Ming is a very experienced speaker, and you can clearly see in his delivery of the subject. The subject matter is a little bit abstract. It is not very easy to understand, and yet Wai Ming delivered with the excellent pace that we can all easily follow along. And I also like the fact that he used very conversational language and not very formal language that we typically see in writings. His hand gesture is super, uh, his hand gesture is also very effective. Uh, and you can really see he, uh, like his point of emphasis uh, as he uses his hand to communicate. And his, this, uh, his, to, in today's speech, uh, he gave a very structured outline of, uh, uh, of uh, leadership in the family business. He started by introducing what family business is, a concept that many of us are not very familiar with. And then he explained his concept by telling a story, which I also think is one of the more effective way of explaining a concept. It's not just by saying it, but telling it with a story. There's only two things I, uh, I think that, 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 that I can, might consider as in potential improvements. Uh, the first one has to do with it might help in the beginning of the speech to frame the speech in such a way that it gains audience interest. Basically tell the audience what's in it for them. Why should they care about the speech and what are they going to learn from it? Uh, this way, in case of this subject is a little bit far away from day-to-day -day life, at least they know, uh, you know what to expect and not get bored out of it. Uh, the second suggestion I have is uh, also, along similar lines, uh, perhaps getting to the main point of the speech earlier. Uh, again, because the, this, this subject required a lot of setup, so, so I, I think it was maybe like four minutes or five, five minutes in before you get into a story. Uh, so, so again, like I think uh, probably you, know, you might, you might want to think about how to structure the speech so that you get to the main topic a little earlier. Uh, but overall, uh, again, the takeaway point is very interesting. And, uh, and we, I think we all feel inspired by the story that you told about managing a family business, even though it's something that we're not gonna be doing for a while, but the, 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 the concept of uh, you know, thinking about your future, thinking about your children, I think that's something that we can all take away with. Thank you. Back to you, Mr. January Evaluator. Thank you, Tao. Our next evaluator is our president, Hannah. Hannah will be evaluating Georgie. Hannah is also a, uh, a great speaker uh, and has given a lot of speeches on personal improvement, small businesses, and Hannah has, Hannah's insights on business and finance are always great, so it'll be great to listen to what she has to say. Uh, Hannah? Good morning. Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator, and good morning once again, Toastmasters and most welcome guests. 
Uh, Georgie, I was uh, expecting a Naylor speech on uh, finances or financial background, but I did was uh, very pleasantly uh, pleased that you talked about charitable foundations. Um, I did do some work with the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, which uh, asset wise is up there in the billions, I would say they still rank pretty high um, in terms of how big of a charity they are. And I did hear uh, somebody mention Juniper Networks, which is also a giver here in Silicon Valley. So uh, very tied to the, this local area here. Um, I, you did walk through a lot of things where, um, and a lot of great, like, uh, I guess, a lot of great, like, quotes. And um, you did reference Art Andrew Carnegie. I was surprised you didn't mention the Rockefeller family as much. Um, but that was a very good insight that you provided in terms of charitable giving. I didn't feel lost on your speech at all. I felt like it came natural to you. Uh, in terms of your vocal variety, it was always high. You had hand gestures. You provided clarity during your speech. And in articulating your topic, it was very clear. Your slides were clean. Um, some of the slides didn't match each other. But in terms of overall the topic, talking about the different foundations, going over taxes, which is a huge thing. That's one of the main reasons people give. Um, and in terms of uh, towards the end, there was a lot of resources that you did cover for people to get the interest of the topic. And, and what was lost on me overall was kind of just the why. Um, and that's sometimes what I think about people don't know what you care about until they know why. So why you chose this topic, why it interests you. And then in the end that you did pose a question to the group where you kind of did that call to action of like, what are you going to give or what kind of impact are you going to have? Um, which was actually, uh, which did come off pretty clear, but could have uh, been a little bit stronger and more supported towards the end. So um, the what's in it for me is kind of like what's in it for the group, right? And so like, what kind of impact can you make? Um, there is even possibilities where you can start a uh, donor fund. So in my experience, I worked with uh, donor engagement and I worked with corporate giving um, and a lot of the corporations here in Silicon Valley for a brief time because my friend had got me into it. She had worked for the uh, public foundation. So um, it was a very, uh, a very, uh, I guess, a very eye-opening experience. And I feel like you covered a lot of the parts of it um, in your speech. So within your speech, it was easy to follow. Um, in terms of challenging for talking from experience, I know uh, you challenge yourself to talk about a topic that you normally wouldn't because you're very technical. So I've also found that uh, very enlightening. So overall, I would say you challenge yourself pretty well to cover a topic I would feel that you wouldn't normally cover if it's not technical or technology based. Um, just the level of interest and in why why you chose this topic, I would just want to see a little more clear. So overall, Georgie, great speech. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Hannah. At this point, I'd like to turn control over back to our uh, Toastmaster. Or is it Thank our topics master? It should be our Toastmaster. I'll handle it. Okay, I'm handing it over to our Table Topics Master for the today. Our Table Topics Master is Georgie. Georgie, please take it. Hey, good morning, everyone. Today, our theme for the meeting was equilibrium. And I thought I would continue along that theme with some of our table topics questions. The concept in table topics is that you are simulating what it would be like to be trapped as an uh, entrepreneur in an elevator with one of your VCs and someone asks you an off the wall question and you have to try to answer it in a way that makes you sound intelligent and not stumbling over your words. So imagine that we're simulating that situation. So today, let me start by asking a question associated with equilibrium. The question is, has your life ever been out of balance? And if so, how could you tell that it was out of balance? Does anyone want to take this question? Oh, and just to remind everyone, we have a word of the day of opine. So give it some thought. You know, you might want to opine about some topics. Anyone would like to take this question when your life was out of balance and how you could tell? Otherwise, I will select a volunteer. After a speech on charity, and this is all I get. Okay, so let's start with uh, Tao, whose life is currently not in balance since he is trapped in quarantine. Thank you, Georgie. 
it's a very interesting topic because my first instinct when you asked the question was, when was my life ever in balance? And I think the answer might just be never, uh, at least for at, as far as I can remember. I'm actually of the personality that tend to singularly focus on one thing. So there have been years where I singularly focus on work. And then you have the other extreme where this year I was singularly focused on well, something other than work. So I have to admit that, that this notion of balance is kind of a foreign concept for me. Although I will say this though, I, I do think the notion of balance is also subjective. Balance does not imply that it's a 50-50 split. I mean, that might be balanced for some people, but that, that's not necessarily the case for everybody. I, I think you know, finding the right balance and right equilibrium is a very much of a sub subjective notion. It's whatever you are comfortable with. And if it comes up to be 90-10, and I think that's potentially, uh, that, that's probably when you, that's probably a good balance to strike if that's what you really want. However, I think the key is you want this to be a deliberate choice. You don't want to be forced into a situation where you're making a choice, but you don't really want to do that. And that's when you know you're out of balance, is a situation where, uh, for instance, you want to be spending more time with family, but you can't. And so that, that's a situation where you know that you're going to be, uh, you, you, you're going to need to be adjusting the balance. Uh, the other way to tell is if the people around you start to act differently. If your friends start to, you know, getting out of touch with you, or your significant others start to have, uh, start to applying for different uh, solutions or different weekend plans, you know you probably need to do something different. Back to you, uh, Ms. Table Topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right. Moving on, we're going to look at that same question, but we're, so the question is, has your life ever been out of balance? And if so, what did you do about it? Do I have any volunteers for describing what they did with an out of balance life? So nobody, I will then select our Toastmaster, Gautam. Could you please repeat the question again? The question is, has your life ever been out of balance? And if so, what did you do about it? Thank you, Georgie. Yeah, I used to notice, am I in the right state of mind? Or am I in the balanced state? So I feel like I'm not in the balanced state, and I'll take a break. I always remember one thing. It's if, if I cannot fly, I should walk. If I cannot walk, I should take a baby steps. If I cannot take a baby steps, I should take a break. Then I'll try to again fly again. So keep on trying until I reach what I want. Being in a very balanced state of mind and both physically and mentally, it's uh, essential for our need. How to check the kind of a checkpoint? Are we in a balanced state or not? That's most challengeable one that I, I think compared to being in a balanced state. Because if we know that we are out of balance, then it's very easy to fix it. How do we know if it is out of balance? That's a different question. So I always look for cues. Could be in a productive, if it is a work-related work. Could be like how I react to my environment and the people surrounded me. Sometimes we do not notice it. I do notice if I get a feedback or a signal from my opposite side. Oh, okay, didn't work what I was intended to do. Okay, then that's a signal to me. Okay, what should I do to make it balanced? So once I noticed it, take a break and I'll follow 
if, if it was miscommunicated, try to fix it. If it was interpreted in a different way, I'll fix it. So noticing the balanced state is really important compared to trying to fix it or to talk, uh, table topic master charging. Thank you very much. All right. The next question is, have, uh, if you read up on books that suggest how to maintain equilibrium or balance in your life, one of the things that a lot of books suggest is that you just say no when people ask you to do more and more. So my question is, can you give us an example of when your life was out of balance and you realized that you just said no? Hannah. Thank you, Mrs. Top, uh, Mrs. Table Topics Master. I will opine, or I have opined that there's no such thing as balance. Um, I, I believe, I'm a firm believer in that. I more I am more inclined to believe in seasons, that life has seasons. There, there's uh, times in your life where you're going to spend a lot of time on work. There's times in your life where you're going to spend more time with your family. Um, there's times in your life where you're going to spend more time doing something that you didn't anticipate that you would be involved in. Uh, I, being a person of a yes mentality, tend to say yes to a, way more things than I should <laughs> and way more obligations and opportunities than I should. So. Um, only because I come from a place of learning and education. I'm always curious about things. Um, even in saying yes to this charity oper uh, opportunity, I never thought I would work briefly with the foundation. Um, I did for about a year, and it was very enlightening, but I wouldn't think I would ever say yes. A good friend and mentor of mine said, I need your help in corporate giving, and, and the opportunity was there. So um, did I continue that career path? No, but it did teach me a lot. Um, I have also said yes to different Toastmaster clubs, um, and then most recently, I have also said no to different Toastmaster clubs that have been like, hey, we want you to join, and I have said no. Um, so learning to say no is something very new and foreign to me, and most of the time I do say yes, even in um, my uh, networking groups and meetups and starting new meetup groups, even faith-based organizations that are like, we want you to be involved and we want you to be a leader, I am more inclined to say yes. So I would agree that saying no is one of those things that is very important to me. Um, I have recently started to do it because I'm just running out of time <laughs> that I have available <laughs> to commit to different kind of things. So I would say, yeah, definitely practice saying no. Um, but in a way, also keep that yes mentality. You never know who you're going to meet, what you're going to learn, and who you're going to get connected to. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hey, let's see. All right, so next question. When you are trying to maintain your sanity among all the different things you're trying to do, do you have any sort of a daily, weekly, monthly practice that helps you to maintain balance? And if so, what do you do? So Harun, do you do? Thank you, Madam Table Topics Master. Fellow guests, welcome, most welcome guests, and fellow Toastmasters, what daily routines, monthly routines, and weekly routines do I maintain to maintain equilibrium or balance in my life? That's a very interesting question, and it has evolved. It's, it's a topic that I'm very interested in for personal growth. I came originally uh, to personal organization and learning from a very chaotic personal life. Not, not in the sense that I was disorganized or didn't have it together, but my day consisted really of completely unstructured activities that were completely random. Now, apart from the big categories like work and you know eating and doing general day-to-day -day stuff, it was, I had no schedule or structure in my day. But slowly I've evolved the system, I realize that. And I use a, I've decided to slot up my time in terms of days, weeks, and months. So every day, I, what I do is that I actually look at my calendar and I look at my to-do list and allocate time to do them and plan them out. 
I've been using a technique called the 168 hour technique where I basically divide up my day into 30 hour slots and I track how I'm spending that time. And I take that at the end of every week, I actually look at how I spent those 168 hours and then plan my week accordingly. And every month, I actually set sort of some themes that I want to accomplish in that month. Is that effective? I don't know over the long term. I've decided not to focus on long term goals as much, but to sort of focus on these hours, days, and weeks and accomplishing those little tasks that I think will get me to where I want to be in, say, a year or two years. Obviously, a lot of plans didn't work out at the beginning of this year, but I hope to make a fresh start at the beginning of next year as things return to normal or as normal as they close to normal as they can get. Thank you, Madam Tabletop Master. Thank you. All right. For our next question, the question is, have you figured out what is your balance state? And in figuring it out, did you work at it or did you just know? Did it just kind of come and did evolve organically? So uh, Deepak, would you like to take the question? Yeah, thank you, Madam, Madam Table. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot for this question, ma'am. Um, certainly, uh, this is a really interesting topic and uh, I would like to touch upon it. Um, so yes, as, as, as I'm, I'm working as a consultant and suddenly my life is, it, it has been out of balance since, since, since I joined as a uh, consultant. It's always a customer who drive us and, you know, they control us basically. So I was trying to improve, improve it and uh, I found this uh, power of now from Eckhart Tolle and, and uh, the book called Deep Work. So these are the keys for me, I believe, um, you know, and this work really well for me. When I, when I start focusing on the important part and started automating the uh, unimportant stuff, basically I started saving some time from, from the work and started kind of utilizing that time uh, for other things and, and to start balancing it. Um, also, the, the, uh, the concept from the book, The Power of Now, is to focus on now and kill all the worries about the past and the future because it really doesn't exist. What exists is now. And this is the most powerful concept I think uh, I found uh, in that book and which is impacting my life positively. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's the thing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Now we have one person who has another question. Uh, how are we doing on time, Mr. T uh, Toastmaster? Uh, I think uh, we have a question. We have a time for one question. One more question. Great. All right. We have one more question for Waming, our final volunteer. All right. So with respect to balance and equilibrium. Some people go so extreme that they find the only way that they are going to be able to maintain any sort of balance in, in, in this extreme form is to completely disconnect from the internet. Have you disconnected from the internet before or do you think that is too extreme for somebody living in Silicon Valley? Ms. To uh, Ms. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmaster, most welcome guest. Disconnect for the internet. Well, certainly, if if I'm I'm not sure how uh, how that works because I cannot connect disconnect for the internet. It is the source of everything. You know, every, all my speeches come from there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Without the internet, I cannot give a speech. I have no idea what things are. <laughs> so, at the same time, uh, if one wants to become a monk or a hermit or someone who goes off. There's a story about this guy who went off to Africa or Alaska or wherever in the wilderness and then eventually he dies. If you want to do that, that's up to you. However, I don't recommend it. I think 
you want access to whether it's the internet, information, everything, because that is life. That is the, the most important thing, the most precious is to be able to, to get information, work with people, learn from people, build the world up. Otherwise, you just end the worm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Words of the womb, a virus or something else. And, and it's okay if, if you want to choose to do that, but I don't recommend it. Ms. Toastmaster. All right, thank you very much, Hua Ming. And with that, that's the end of our table topics section. I do want to remind everyone that we're gonna have a vote later and everybody gets to be a candidate for the best table topics person. Meanwhile, I will now be transitioning over to our general Thank evaluator, Harun. Thank you, uh, Madam Table Topics Master. I will be general, uh, doing the general evaluation for the meeting. And at first, and at first order, I'd like to call on our, uh, our roles. So our first uh, role will be our odd counter who will be reporting on the number of odds and ums that we have done. Now, since the odd counter myself and was also the grammarian, I will be using this opportunity to sort of combine these roles and tell you as how many odds and ums and, and the uses of grammar that I noticed that I really liked or in my interpretation of the, of the language did not approve of. And I will report that as, uh, as, as the people who have actually spoken. So our first speaker was Wai Ming. Wai Ming, I counted five ahs during your speech. And here are the things that uh, the noted users of grammars that I found. Was one of the things that I really liked is about your use of climbing the ladder. And then you, then you combine that with different kinds of ladders that you may encounter in different professions, the corporate ladder, the political ladder, and the family business ladder. Um, and I thought that was a very interesting way of actually saying that, you know, how many, uh, that, that there are many ways to climb to go, uh, to go up. Our next speaker was Georgie. Georgie, you're, uh, in terms of odds and ums, you were very clear and concise. And I didn't notice any kind of odds and ums. Yeah, I only counted two. The only thing that I would uh, I saw over there was I didn't notice any gram grammatical mistakes. And the one thing that I did notice was that oh yes, you mentioned Alexander de Tocqueville, but in your slides you had mentioned Alexis. So I wasn't sure which was the right, uh, right name to use over there. Our next evaluator, uh, our next evaluator uh, speaker was Tao, who was evaluating. And uh, I, I really liked your, uh, uh, your use of uh, the, uh, the word uh, grammar of conversational. I thought that was really interesting about your conversational style. I only noted five ahs and ums. Uh, one thing that I also uh, noticed in my end, and I, I took a note of that, was that when I introduced you, I called you a prolific reader. I wanted to say voracious reader, but it, I, I was sort of uh, mixing up uh, uh, the reader and writer, uh, the adjectives for writing. Hannah, uh, then our next evaluator was Hannah. I counted seven uh, ahs and ums. Our table topics was the, uh, in our table topics, I noticed that Georgie, you mentioned not stumbling on your words. That's a very interesting phrase uh, to use in, uh, in a conversation. And then the next one was Tao, who said that all your choices have to be deliberate. And, and I thought that was, that really made your table topics answer very uh, impactful. Gautam, I noticed two ahs and ums during your answer and uh, and Hannah, you, you use a phrase called life has seasons. I thought that was really well done. And for myself, I counted five odds when I gave my table topics answer. And that's my report. I'd now like to call upon the timer 
to give us a timing report. As a general evaluator, in terms of timing for the speeches, I spoke for seven minutes, uh, seven minutes and 50 seconds, Georgie 745. In the evaluation, Tao spoke for 250, Hana 250. Table topics, Tao 212, Gautam 216, Hana 155, Harun 219, Deepak 132, and myself 131. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Timer. Our next, uh, our next uh, duty master is Gaudin, and Gaudin will be our board master. Uh -huh. opinion, can you opine on what was the usage of the word? Sure. So I noticed uh, Wyoming George Harun used the word, and uh, if I missed any of you, like. Uh, please apologize. Uh, thank you. Our next video, our next duty master is the joke master. Wyoming duty so, Mr. Yes, uh, Mr. Toastmaster, just a very short joke. A man just finished his LASIK eye surgery, and the surgeon led him into the office to discuss about the surgery. So the doctor said, would you like the good news or the bad news first? The man excitedly replies, I will take the good news first. The surgeon says, well, you're going to get a new dog. That's it. You didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> LASIK surgery. You finished the surgery, the good news or bad news. And then the surgeon said, uh, uh, I'll give you the good news. You're going to get a new dog. Oh. <laughs> okay. Right. Then, so please submit your votes, and then I'd like to turn it over back to our the, our president, Hannah. Oh, I I have to do the general evaluation. I I apologize. Um, as a meeting, hey, this meeting was went really well. The uh, the meeting uh, we started up a little little bit late, but we had a good turnout and. Uh, we uh, we had a last minute cancellation, so our backup speaker actually stepped up. I'd urge all of us, and myself including, to always uh, be available for speaking. Uh, the uh, the Zoom format actually gives a lot of opportunities to speak and practice and hone our art. And I think that Zoom, that given the pandemic and work from home, this state of work will actually help us in a lot of areas not just uh, in, in our public speaking. Overall, I think uh, the meeting and the questions were, were really interesting and we are almost on time to wrap up the meeting as well. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'd like to now turn over control to our president, Hannah. All right. Oh, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator. And we are going to fill roles for next week, but we can also announce the winners um, where everybody did amazing this morning. So thank you guys for everybody's participation, especially in table topics. Um, everybody got a chance. So that's, that's awesome. It's always a great meeting. Um, in terms of roles for next week, do we have any speakers that want to sign up? Sign up. Everyone? Tao, uh, so I'll put you guys down. We do also have a guest speaker um, that will be coming in next week. So, and then I think Wai Ming is up for secondary. So um, I think, uh, yeah, Harun Tao and then the guest speaker. So let me put that down. Evaluator, does anybody want to be evaluator for next week? Georgie, awesome. 
You said evaluate it, right? Yeah. Okay. And then table topics, um, the guest speaker may take like up to 10 minutes, but we can alternatively just put a table topics master in case. Uh, does anybody want to be a tentative table topics master? I can be tentative. Okay. Oh, Toastmaster for next week, the most important rule. <laughs> Who wants to be? Why me? Okay, excellent. Awesome. Okay, that'll get us going for next week. And then before uh, we announce winners, uh, Deepak, we'll have you unmute. And then if you have any closing comments for what you thought of the meeting or um, what you learned today, anything you want to share out, just to get guest feedback. So any, any comments you want to, if you want to unmute and throw them there. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, yeah, certainly. So, first of all, thanks a lot. Uh, really, it's it's. Um, though I wasn't able to, you know, be on topic, and I forget a lot of things when I come on, I came, uh, you know, and started answering the question. But overall, the meeting and the 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 this session was really awesome, and I think uh, I, I really appreciate your support, all all those master master support uh, for um, onboarding. A person like me in this and and providing this platform and opportunity to um, to any newcomer who would like to take a public speaking uh, you know who would like to run public speaking so thanks a lot really appreciate it awesome Deepak thank you all right excellent all right and let's announce some winners let's announce some winners is very competitive especially for table topics this morning so please give a drum roll. Drum roll, please, for best table topics master. Once again, a fierce competition. We have Deepak. <laughs> we did have a couple people we also want to recognize, um, Har uh, Haroon as well. So Haroon, also a uh, great job on table topics. So fierce competition for this morning. And for best evaluator, we had a blow out of the water, best of the, oh, blow out of the water, almost. You know, I was competitive too. You know, I threw in that competition, but it was Tao. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I gave a Tao run for his money, but Tao was the best one. So congratulations, Tao. <laughs> awesome. Uh, best speaker, oh, let me go and refresh best speaker. Please give a drum roll, please. Please give a drum roll to Y Ming. Well, I mean, best speaker for this morning. Congratulations. All right, great job, everyone. And if we want to take a photo, I think we have a few minutes left here. Uh, unless anybody has announcements, announcements, anything they want to share out. All right. I will actually, I, I guess I'll throw an announcement out there. Um, John Godoy is going to be our guest speaker for next week. He's going to be about seven to 10 minutes on ESL, so English as a second language, and ESL speakers. So it's going to be a, he's going to have some nice things to share. And we'll, we'll set up an announcement for that as well. All right. Uh, Haroon, I think you're the video master, but I can also yeah. take a screenshot. Hold on. <laughs> Are you going to take a screenshot? Every yeah, everybody looks live. <laughs> okay, awesome. Done. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>